all things open. I hope you are open to the talk we're about to give today. Systemic inequality in America won't be solved until we make some real change. Before we start, how about some introductions and we can get into our topic and hopefully all things will be open in the end. Greetings, my name is Jason Brewer. My preferred pronouns are he and him. I'm an Aquarius hailing from the South where we don't do unsweet tea. Over the past couple of years, I've had the privilege to work with some amazing Elasticsearch and database engineers at MailChimp where we get to solve difficult and interesting problems that help empower the underdog. Good morning, everyone. My name is Johnny Preer. My preferred pronouns are he and him. I too am in the metro Atlanta area and I've been in tech for about 20 years. Currently, I'm an engineering manager at MailChimp along with Jason. And in my formal professional life, believe it or not, I used to be a math teacher. I've seen a lot of the good and bad in tech over the past years. And like Jason, I am passionate about increasing diversity in our field. Read any good books during the pandemic? I recently read an article that since March, the number of books being read has increased significantly. If you have any good suggestions, please share. I love a good story. Recently, I read The Alchemist, which I highly recommend. The author told an amazing fable that was a wrapper for a great philosophy on life. I'm here today to share with you the fable of Jason Brewer trying to provide an opportunity to the underrepresented. It's a working title. This story takes place a long, long ago, before the times of TikTok, Facebook, and my thinning hair. Google had just gone public in 2004, and I just bought my first condo. The Acme Corp, which I worked for at the time, was, at, was near the CNN Center in Centennial Olympic Park in downtown Atlanta, Georgia. Our office was on the fifth floor and the data center was on the fourth directly below us. I was sitting in a dark lit IT room facing a white parking deck. This is where we house all of our IT hardware. I was building Linux servers so that they can be racked and stacked directly below me in our data center. These servers would house our new ticketing system while I was waiting for that progress bar to slowly move across the screen, I noticed to the side of me, a pile of HP desktops that just had been pulled from the office floor and were deemed for a recycle. They were still in good condition and were scheduled to be picked up by a third party vendor who bought end of life hardware. The desktop life cycle at Acme Corp was three years old is three years old for a computer? My daughter who plays Roblox on a decade old Core 2 Duo would disagree. But what should I do with them? And how can I use them to make a difference? I was about to get married to my best friend and my mom suggested we get marriage counseling at, at the African Methodist Episcopal Church. I had fond memories of every Sunday morning, the music was fantastic, but I also had nightmares of my mom pinching me as I nodded off to the word. Times had changed and my fiance, we were a little leery of organized religion because well, they weren't accepting of everyone. We decided to give it a shot anyway, because mama knows we, we met the most amazing pastor. She was open-minded, caring, and very thoughtful. To this day, I call her my spiritual North Star. She always pushes me to make a change for others because I am so blessed. This was inspiring and felt, 
fell right in line with how I felt about technology, the way it could impact an individual, a family, even a community. No longer did you need the financial means to afford an expensive college degree to create an opportunity. With just a computer, the right attitude and aptitude, an impactful change could occur. It could be seismic. Computers are what I needed and I knew exactly where to get them. The only hurdle I had to overcome was convincing an executive to donate computers to my church. I convinced myself that Monday would be the day I walked into his office and made that request. Monday morning came. I stepped off the elevator onto the fifth floor and walked into the lobby. Beep, I scanned my badge and stared at the office's faded blue carpet as I walked down the corridor of gray cubicles to my desk. I sat down at my desk, holding onto my book bag like a life preserver. I felt like I was drowning. What would I say to the big boss man? That day, my productivity, it was non-existent. I could feel the butterflies in my stomach and my hands started to shake in anticipation. There was no backing out now. I got up, walked down what felt like an endless hallway to his office. The door was open, but I still knocked on the metal frame. The boss man looked up. He greeted me and invited me into his office. I took the biggest breath and I started into my pitch. What seemed like eternity was, open, was over in five minutes. Without even hesitating, he granted my request and donated the computers to the church. Success, or so I thought. I delivered the computers to the church that evening. I talked to my pastor and she thought it was a great idea. The only part that was actually missing was a plan. How could I turn this half-baked idea into a life-changing opportunity for someone? I wasn't prepared for the challenge of, challenges of getting someone to believe that they could overcome the challenges life had put in front of them. Johnny and I have been passionate about making a difference in these communities. We've been thinking about ways we can help these underrepresented groups. We've both been in technology for nearly two decades and we've seen what does and doesn't work. Johnny is now going to share with you what we think does work and how we can make a lasting change in these communities so we can slowly address some of the systemic issues we see today in America. Thanks, Jason. And could you stop presenting? I need to, I'll present now. Thank you, sir. Thanks again, Jason. Unfortunately, there is still a sizable tech knowledge gap for underrepresented groups. Let's look at a few ways we can address this. The first item to address in getting more underrepresented people into tech is addressing the hiring pipeline. Traditionally, the pipeline has been companies going to colleges and universities and rating their computer science departments for candidates. However, far and wide across the nation, at least in the United States, computer science departments are dominated by white men. The magazine Wired in 2018 did an article taking a peek into computer science diversity at college and university level. This graph I have included in our slides kind of underscores this discrepancy. We can see the number of white males who are computer science majors easily trumps all other groups listed. This underrepresentation at college skews that traditional hiring pipeline. So how do we address this representation issue? One way is to increase the early involvement of underrepresented groups in tech. One way to increase minority participation is through such organizations as Black Girls Code and Code.org, 
two of the more preeminent ones across the um, United States, at least. There are many others, but these are probably two that I think everyone here has probably heard of. These organizations believe in giving minorities as early as kindergarten an early intro to tech that normally many of them might not see. The CEO of Code.org, Hadi Pertovi, in a 60 Minutes interview from several years ago, had a very telling quote. And his quote was, middle school is roughly when girls traditionally drop out of STEM fields. The idea of Code.org and other orgs is by exposing other, the underrepresented to entry-level tech skills, this sets them up for success in middle school, high school, and beyond. So as I mentioned earlier, traditionally a college degree in a STEM field has been the gateway to a career in tech. However, as education costs rise, this route has become a harder one for many to follow. Also, while college has been the main pipeline, it is not the only one. In my career, many of the most brilliant technologists I've ever worked with either never went to college or did go to college and didn't study in a STEM field. So maybe it's time for companies looking for talent to de-emphasize the traditional collegiate pipeline. There are many ways to do this, but one way to potentially address this are boot camps. We've all heard of boot camps. They're a great avenue for many to learn a tech skill and to build a, a portfolio for finding a job. However, just like colleges and universities, boot camps are not cheap and can be cost prohibitive for many. So how about this? Companies looking to increase and diversify their talent pipelines can help that effort by offering scholarships and other financial assistance to boot camps for those looking to pursue this route. By doing this, they can create their own pipeline or augment their current one. However, there is one caveat to this. If companies are indeed looking to subsidize and fund boot camps, they must be intentional in recruiting diverse candidates for these boot camps and the subsequent hiring after participants complete the program. Don't just pay lip service to the talk on diversity. Let's be intentional in the hiring and filling these roles. Even before choosing a route to follow in tech, students need hardware. And as we're discovering during the COVID-19 pandemic, internet access to start. Many companies and local boards of education are able to provide partial or fully, fun, fully subsidized equipment to students. This is great, but as I said, with COVID-19, we've, we've discovered that internet access is a crucial element for that. It's assumed nowadays that everyone has some type of reliable internet connectivity, but really that's not totally the case. As I said, I'm, I'm in the Metro Atlanta area. My wife is a middle school teacher here, and throughout her remote and virtual teachings, I've heard, I've heard painstaking stories from her from students who have adequate hardware, but no or substandard internet connection. That's a problem. So companies looking to build and diversify their talent pipelines should work with government officials and telecom agencies to band together and make internet connectivity a basic utility for all. The new normal under COVID-19 has exposed this as a must have for students going forward. And finally, while software engineering is certainly a great starting point for a career in tech, by no means is it the only path. Years ago when I was a computer science major, I enjoyed coding, I was pretty good at it, but at the time, the prospect of sitting at a desk and doing that eight hours a day as, as a career, was it really palatable to me? It's not until I discovered the infrastructure side of things, system engineering, network engineering, things like that, that I was able to marry that coding experience with a more hands-on thing that really whet my appetite and really got me started in my career. There are a wealth of jobs to be had in tech. Some which certainly leverage a coding background, but many that necessarily do not. As you can tell from my slide, there are many diverse fields to choose from. And I probably left a few out. In closing, 
I hope that Jason and I have motivated you to think more about how to make your organization and the entire tech field in general more diverse. I'll leave you with one of our favorite quotes from the late John Lewis. When you see something that is not right, not just, not fair, you have the moral obligation to say something, to do something. Thank you very much. Thank you guys so much. That was a great first talk and you, you deserve some applause. There isn't enough of that in this format, <laughs> but you nailed it. Congratulations. Um, we have one question from the audience, which I sort of took a swag at answering, but I I'm, would love to have you comment. Um, a woman named Shambi Broom, I'm assuming a woman, I apologize, um, is running a nonprofit where they focus on um, computer science training for females. How do you respond to people who are offended by the fact that we have females as a focus? We don't exclude anyone, but we have a core mission to bring more women into tech. Guys, got any ideas? That's always a tricky one. Uh, I all my, my radar goes off when people when someone complains about you know something that's trying to increase diversity. It's it's almost like you know, you know open your eyes. There's there's a reason why we're doing this. It is not, and I think like um, Shambi said, you're not trying to be exclusive, but it is just another pipeline to. Um, it's almost like you know they're gatekeepers of like, hey, I, only these people can have the key to tech or anything it, it's certainly not that I, I think um groups like that is to you know be inclusive but maybe have as part of their, their mission um the goal to increase you know participation in a particular group so i don't know if that's helpful or not but um certainly seeing that a lot it's it's definitely um, something to certainly deal with great thank you now um i'm i'm taking more questions if somebody has one that they'd like to ask these gentlemen but and we have a few minutes left for questions for this talk. Um, I am going to ask a couple that came up for me. So I'm interested in how you got your plan together, <laughs> Jason, because you said that, that, that you're part of the talk. You were sort of, and then there had to be a plan. Did, did uh, I'm sorry, John, uh, Jason, yeah. Did Johnny come in and like help you build a plan or how did you actually pull it together? Well, so after I delivered the computers and I, I brought some of the, the younger uh, members of our church in and, and tried to expose them uh, to some, some basic uh, coding uh, concepts. And it, it, it quickly became a, a big challenge uh, because uh, I think my approach wasn't uh, well thought out. Uh, so when I came across that problem, I kind of just, uh, spent some time with my pastor and uh, other people that I've worked with in the industry to kind of come up with a uh, your uh, entry into uh, learning more about technology and kind of getting down to the basics. Like, what's what's a what's a CPU? What's a RAM? What's a motherboard? Uh, you know, the basic concepts of a computer and kind of get hands on uh, training, which uh, I think got a little bit more engagement because, you know, just that tactile feel of, of touching the hardware and understanding how it works uh, was, was a better uh, launch point. And uh, it definitely drove engagement. Yeah. I think that underscores kind of the whole exposure at an early age. And, you know, because I tell my kids this all the time, um, I try to show them everything. And they're like, Dad, this sucks. I don't want to learn this. I'm like, one day you're going to appreciate this, which <laughs> is kind of dad speak. But it's it totally is true because I look back on my um, childhood, the biggest thing my mom and dad gave for me was exposure. And in 1981 or two, that Apple II Plus that my dad got for Christmas basically set me on the path for where I am now. So yeah. I, I think just, just throwing posts and giving them those nuggets just speaks volumes. And, you know, yeah, never know I, I agree. I, I actually got into this field. My degree's in French literature. I got into tech by, I had a job um, doing record management at a law firm, and I started doing a talk for librarians essentially who were afraid of computers and were getting jobs in law firms and law firms were all computerizing this is the 80s and they didn't know what to make of it and I did the same thing I took machines apart you know here's a disk drive it's kind of like a little record player right <laughs> so we have a couple more questions um, 
Uh, there's one about mesh networks, but I'm going to go to the, the one before it first. Um, what were your inspirations and paths into technology? How do you promote STEM in school systems that may not have resources to teach it? But do this one fast because I've got another one for you too. So quickly, mine was literally my dad buying Apple IIe. Um, and also, believe it or not, was Texas Instruments um, computers back in the day, like the old red kind of LED ones. I was totally fascinated by how they worked. And it really got me into the path of math and computer science. But that was kind of my early entry into it. Cool. How about you, Jason? Uh, so my dad worked at IBM. He worked at Big Blue back in the 80s. And uh, we got an IBM PC Junior that had the big memory blocks that look like uh, literal blocks. Uh, so we basically tore it down, rebuilt it. And uh, I was just a kid into video games. So uh, IBM would have these sessions once a month. You can go to the office. They teach a little bit about programming. And uh, I, I kind of literally just got into programming and learning more about DOS so I could play video games. That was cool. Stuff. Great. And what do you think about this problem of STEM where there's no resources? Ooh, good question. Uh, that's where I, I think our educational um, systems have to be have to be really intentional and focused on this. Um, you know, you may not have resources, but you know, you have a community of people that can potentially help. So I think lean on every resource you have, um, and and you know, really call on the outside folks if you're really hurting that um, bad for it. So I know it's a tough problem to solve, and um, yeah, I, I, I know, know there are plenty out there willing to help. In, in the richer states, they're having to hand out um, iPads and you know minimum devices just to conduct school that uh, during lockdowns, right? Which has got to help. I mean, some of those kids have never had their hands on one of those things before. So this could be a long conversation, but I just feel like you took a little bit of our defense uh, budget spending right. of the government and put it towards the schools we could definitely address a lot of the STEM issues that we're seeing. And uh, of course, there's some problems with gerrymandering and the way they line up school districts and putting funding towards the more affluent areas. Like we need to find a way to make that exposure and that opportunity equal across all areas uh, of, of the United States. Yeah, totally agree with that. Um, okay, how about this mesh network question? How, did the, how would mesh networks fit into a strategy to give folks better internet access? Good question. I know that I know that Google and Amazon are, are trying to um, the approach of guess either low um, high altitude balloons or low altitude satellites, depending on your way of doing this, to have some kind of more kind of a mesh network thing. So I, I think that's a great start. Um, you know, I, I love to see where that goes. The, the engineer in me kind of was dubious to the reliability and kind of the speeds that you need, especially nowadays of like streaming and things like that. So um, I think it's a good start. Yeah, it's we something institutional has to happen and Google and companies like Google seem like they have the best incentive to do it. Maybe also the cable companies could go that way, but Exactly. Um okay, yeah, I, I'm going to have I, I Jason, I'm going to have to actually start switching over. So, I'm hoping that um that Dr. Rochelle Newton made it back in to the fold and if you would turn your camera on and wave at me so I know that you're really here, that would be really helpful. <laughs> Because otherwise, we'll we'll just keep doing this for the rest of this time. Um, in the meantime, go ahead, Jason, you were going to say. Oh, I was just going to say, I feel like there's some of this infrastructure already set up with our with our cell towers. And, you know, what if we set up these Chromebooks and they had like 5G connections already set with them? And then you subsidize that down to a, a very affordable cost per month, like Johnny was suggesting, maybe make it $10. Uh, yeah, Lincoln's saying he was hoping for com for an answer about community-owned stuff, um, and it, it's a good idea. the pro the The problem, of course, has historically been that all of the wires were owned by, you know, somebody in the communications field. So mm -hmm. Google's trying to jumpstart over that, but you're right; it's still a corporate effort. Yeah, so. and, and some of those wires, you know, I feel like they are totally subsidized by the government. Like these telecom companies aren't putting those bills completely themselves. So, you know, I, it feels like the government could potentially have some leverage over these telecoms. They truly wanted to make this work. And, and I go back to the defense uh, budget that we have here in America. If we could just reduce that by 25%, we could probably address a lot of these issues that we're talking about. 
Yep. Yeah, people are talking in the chat now about how um, much better the internet is outside of America, and I can say it's it. I live in Europe, and it is much better and cheaper. So um, something has to happen there. <laughs> I like the idea of of diverting defense spending because at some point having an informed um, citizenry is is you know part of our national defense. I would think. But, Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. 